Normandy, 1204 AD. For two years, the English-occupied fortress known as the Chateau Gaillard has withstood the trebuchets, battering rams, and tunneling efforts of an attacking French army. It was a stalemate, one that might have continued indefinitely, were it not for an otherwise unremarkable French foot soldier Bonjour. named Peter Bogey. One bloody day, as the battle raged around him, Bogey scanned the exterior of the fortress and saw what no one else did, a weak point ready to be exploited. By some accounts, it was the exit chute of a latrine located inside the fortress's chapel, added at the specific request of England's King John. Regardless of origin, it was a flaw, the only one Bogey needed to enter undetected. Once in, he hauled up dozens of his waiting French comrades. Chaos ensued, English defenders scattered. The siege was over. Thousands of tons of stone, the latest in defensive architecture, and yet no one had thought to secure the toilet. And so the vulnerability sat, unnoticed for years, until the moment when Peter Bogie spotted it and crawled his way into history. Today's fortresses are made of code, not stone. They guard information, not territory or treasure. But they still contain vulnerabilities, architectural flaws overlooked by their creators. And just like in 1204, the Peter Bogies of today Hackers, spies, cyber criminals are searching for undiscovered ways to gain access. So what do you do if you're responsible for protecting the accounts, data centers, and cloud systems relied on by people around the world? You do everything you can to find the vulnerabilities first, wherever they may be. When it's your job to keep billions of people safe online, you have to live and breathe and see the internet just like the attackers do. Because the only way to stop a hacker is to think like one. Remember Royal? He's in charge of privacy, safety, and security at Google. How are you? Hey, Royal. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Oh, there you, you're, you're coming out of that little box there. We are the central team that looks out across all of the Google products for the privacy of users, the security of Google, and much of the internet. Wait, much of the internet? That seems like a lot of extra work. <laughs> right. But to make sure Google's users are safe, it's necessary. After all, people don't just use Google's apps and cloud services. They use hundreds of devices, tools, websites, and operating systems, all different, all connected, just as the Internet's founders intended. They made a decision very early on to open source the standards by which computers and then ultimately web pages would communicate with one another. That was a conscious decision to have an open internet. You can place the improvements in the lives of the billions of people on this planet at the feet of that decision to allow everyone to participate and innovate. But this interconnected world comes at a price. Today, a vulnerability in any part of the system threatens every part of the system. Let's say I'm a, a normal user. I wake up, I get my coffee, I open up my phone. This phone is made by one company. I click on a button to check my email. The app is written by another company. I see a link, I click that link. It opens up my social media site. Something that to a normal user is a 90 second experience that seems like it's nice and smooth and integrated. There's actually a lot of complexity on the back end. The safety of that individual depends on finding a vulnerability and getting it fixed faster in one of those dependent platforms, computers, software packages before they're abused. The open internet, it's harder to defend. Google said we're gonna dedicate a team to finding the hardest to find vulnerabilities. Who's responsible for this team of elite hackers? Meet Parisa Tabriz. She oversees Google's Project Zero, and in a former life, was a bit of a hacker herself. I think I identified at some point as a hacker. I still am in spirit, but I also think of myself as more a hacker manager than a hacker. Years of dealing with the world's nastiest exploits and vulnerabilities 
has made her the perfect person to guide a team that's always on the hunt for new ones. Project Zero makes the internet safer by looking at it through a hacker lens and trying to rigorously, ruthlessly break it and then fix it and prevent problems from happening in the first place. That's right. Project Zero is a team of hackers that makes the internet safer by trying to hack it. Each success eliminates a weak point that would have threatened the people and businesses that rely on Google and the internet at large. But to understand this team's name, you have to understand the vulnerabilities they hunt. A zero-day vulnerability is a weak point in a program's code that's been discovered by an attacker, but not by the people responsible for fixing it. That means when the vulnerability is exploited, defenders will have had zero days' notice. They'll be surprised, exposed, scrambling, just like the English defenders inside Chateau Gaillard. Zero-day vulnerabilities are too powerful, too cheap, and too numerous. There is nothing you can do now. And we think someone has to do something about making them harder to use, making them more expensive, making them less frequent. Zero days have been used in cyber attacks of all kinds, from surveilling human rights activists to damaging physical infrastructure to, well, you remember Aurora. The vulnerability that was exploited there was a bug in Internet Explorer, a Microsoft product. That is the kind of case in point that sometimes the weakest point for Google might be a non-Google product. This is Tim. Smiling is encouraged. <laughs> All right, hi. Tim is the ringleader of Project Zero, and at the age of 15, he was hacked. I was chatting to random people, and they're like, do you want a cup holder? I'm like, what? Like, do you want a cup holder? I'm like, uh, okay. And then they opened my CD drive. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, how did you do that? And then they wouldn't tell me. Each member of the team has their own origin story, but they all have a few things in common. So Great Project Zero member is somebody who loves security research and finding bugs and wanting to find problems that nobody else knows exist. Sometimes people will ask me, how do you find a bug? Or how do you do vulnerability research? And at the end of the day, it's almost like asking someone, how do you make art? To find vulnerabilities hidden inside connected fortresses of all kinds, you need the best. A hacker who can hack anything. My motto is hack everything. Meet Natalie. Hey. True to her motto, Natalie has hacked phones, webcams, arcade games, microwaves, selfie sticks. I do have like a crate of like 50 dismantled selfie sticks. Keyboards, USB sticks, battery packs, fans, and Tamagotchis. I won't lie, I am extremely big fan of Tamagotchis. If you want to hack strange things, there's a lot of stuff out there. And that's just what she does on the weekends. At work, she looks for dangerous vulnerabilities in the apps used by billions of people. I've been looking for vulnerabilities in software for more than 10 years now. And you start to get a feel for where vulnerabilities will be. What sort of stuff do developers make mistakes while writing? And video processing is actually a big one. That's right. The apps we use every day to talk to family, friends, school, and work were potentially home to a zero-day vulnerability. With little more than a hunch, Natalie went to work testing the defensive architecture of various video chat apps by calling herself a lot. I would say one in a thousand things I tried or less worked. That's the nature of hacking and finding vulnerabilities. Almost everything you try doesn't work, but the odd thing does. In this case, the odd thing led to an important discovery, a way to force someone's phone to start transmitting video and audio without them even knowing. Here's how the hack actually works. Natalie sends a chunk of data, known as a packet, to a target phone. A perfectly normal step in making a video call. But hidden in this packet, along with the typical call commands, is extra data that the target software isn't expecting. Most random extra data would simply cause an error. But this extra data, one of the thousands of combinations Natalie tried, acts like a key, tricking the target phone into answering the call without anyone even touching it. Vulnerability confirmed. Exploit executed. Hack completed. Five different video chat applications all had the vulnerability. 
Meaning, if you're one of the billions of people that use these services, it would have been possible for someone to watch and listen to you without your knowledge. Fortunately, there was no evidence the flaw had ever been used for harm. But just like with all of Project Zero's biggest finds, the implications for the safety of our connected world were more than a little ominous. There always is this caution where, you know, what might be a good day of work for you is actually a bad day for users and might reveal something about security that shows things are less secure than we thought. As soon as Natalie notified the various companies of their app's vulnerabilities, changes got made, patches went out, the online world got a little more secure. But getting zero days fixed quickly hasn't always been so easy. Back in the 90s, members of the hacker collective, The Loft, would look for vulnerabilities in the early internet, then do whatever it took to get people to listen, even talk to Congress. The Washington Post described you as rock stars of the computer hacking elite. We appreciate uh, your being with us here today. Within 30 minutes, the seven of you could uh, make the internet unusable for the entire nation. Is that correct? That's correct. And until the problem mushrooms up and enough people complain about it, then they'll come out with a public fix. It was fairly common for particular companies, if you report a bug to them, some of them took more than six months to get fixed. Some of them were just, they just were never fixed. They just went into a black hole. So when Project Zero finds a vulnerability from our own research, we report it to the company, that's day zero. This is the vulnerability, this is where we think it is. Sometimes even this is how we think you should fix it. Um, and that's when we'll start the timer. If a company doesn't fix the bug in 90 days, then on day 90, we put it all online. By online, he means on the Project Zero blog. And while this kind of reveal doesn't happen often, the prospect of having an unpatched vulnerability exposed to the whole world is a powerful motivator. Companies would disagree with us, by the way. They would prefer that we stay silent a lot of the time and, and not talk about this type of stuff. The real core of all of this is that Users lose when things don't get fixed quickly. In December 2018, Google's Threat Analysis Group, or TAG, had discovered a cache of exploits that were being used against a popular mobile device. They came over to Project Zero for analysis. We were able to reverse the exploits, reverse out the vulnerabilities. The implant in there allowed them to pull chat history, photos, GPS locations. You name it, um, it was capable of doing it. We reported those issues to the company and the company that uh, makes that device, um, I believe, pushed out a fix within seven days. More troubling was that Project Zero's analysis revealed the exploits had been in use for quite some time. The exploits that were discovered went back many generations of this particular mobile technology device. This had been happening for many years. The exploits were being used to surveil members of the Uyghur community, an ethnic minority in China. Seeing a capability like this being used against a population, it's like a stark reminder of what we're doing here has importance. And it's not just, you know, playing around with code or dealing with vendor politics or company politics when it comes to disclosures and to and fro's. Like, there are real people getting attacked by bugs like this, and it's important that we do something about it. The exploit being used to surveil the Uyghurs was a major find, but it was just one of many. To date, Project Zero has found over 1,800 zero-day vulnerabilities in everything from operating systems to dating sites to Google's own apps and services. That's 1,800 trap doors that will never be crawled through, 1,800 fortresses that have been made a little more secure. But every day, new code is written, new apps are launched, and the internet we all depend on gets a little more interconnected and a little more vulnerable. Is my job getting harder every year? Well, I hope so, because otherwise we're probably not doing it well. We could like sometimes see on the forums these like financial attackers, credit card thieves being like, darn it, that didn't work anymore. And that was extremely satisfying because I think everyone deserves to be secure. I think that vulnerabilities and security problems harm people both financially and sometimes physically. And I think it's important that everyone is able to use computers in a way that doesn't threaten them.
is there an end game for Project Zero? I would like to see a world where it's incredibly hard to find a vulnerability. Will we get there anytime soon? Probably not. But does that mean we should stop trying? Absolutely not. So, Project Zero stays on the battlefield, inspecting the walls, trying to find and test vulnerabilities first, so they can never be used for harm. You have hackers who use their skills to harm other people and profit, and I usually call them attackers. And you have a lot of hackers who do their work to make software and systems more secure. And I call those folks 